מסכת בבא מציע, פרק הזהב בשעה טובה. Thank God we're about to start the fascinating chapter. I'd like to share with you first a story. It was a great, well-known rabbi in Israel. It was a, not only a giant Torah scholar, but also a Kabbalist. And the story goes that a fellow came and asked him for a blessing. He purchased a new car and he wanted this uh, rabbi of um, um, great name to come and in addition to give a blessing to partake of the first ride. So that rabbi came in and the fascinating story is that the fellow that purchased the car tried to turn on the engine and it didn't happen, it's just like the car stuck there. So he tried a few times, it didn't work out, so the rabbi was about to depart from the car. He left the car and the engine is on. So he called the rabbi, he says, come back, come stay here with me and take the first ride. And the rabbi gets back and sit next to him and again the same story, he turns on the engine and the car is not moving. And that went on for several times. So eventually that rabbi look at him and ask him a question. That rabbi, by the way, name is Rabbi Chaim Kanievsky. He's a well-known rabbi in Israel. So he, Rabbi Kanievsky turned to that fellow and said to him, something is not right with the purchasing of this car. Can you share with me how exactly you got this car? So the fellow said, for sure, I bought it. And I bought it like transactions that they do sometimes in different markets, in kind of a lending market, that I bought it in payment and I pay certain interest. And in exchange, I have this car. Obviously, it's a violation of uh, Torah law. We studied it several times, and it's going to be part of the study later on. As they said in the book of Psalms, that uh, God is the guardian, Shem Shom Recha, the Almighty protected you. In a way, Rav Kanievsky interpreted that it's a special protection from the Almighty not to partake of anything that involved with violation of Torah. So obviously the subject of money, interest, transactions, and more occupy not only today's session, but also the entire chapter. There are many variations of current halakhic issues that is the direct derivative from this chapter. If you take, for example, the issue of Gmach, you see it all over the world, particularly in the observant communities uh, here and in Israel and elsewhere. There are people who open a special um, charity fund, not necessarily with cash, they offer other people items. And the question comes up that when you return an item, it's not in the same condition as you received it. Now, do we differentiate between a relationship between, let's say, neighbors and the Gemach? If a person just gets to borrow from his neighbor um, and he said, I'll bring you back fruits, vegetables, other things. So obviously, the understanding between neighbors is that they're not going to give you the exact one. They give you something that it's a substitute for that. But how you treated the gemach, what exactly the situation when you borrow something from the gemach, especially if um, it's an item that either worn out or if it's a gemach that is serving certain medication and things in that um, nature. Um, from here, we need to understand the concept of the Mishnah, which is Hilchot Kinyanim, understanding the transactions between two parties. Simply speaking, when you attend a grocery store, you go to a grocery store to purchase, let's say, a, just a jar of milk. So you pull out a dollar or several dollars, and in exchange, you get this jar of milk. 
what exactly transpired here. You have two parties. You have you, let's call you Reuven, and you have Shimon, the fellow that's selling the milk to you. That's called metaltelin, the items that are moving from one location to another. And the beauty of uh, Judaism and Jewish law is by merely the fact that you pull out money and place it there, it is not a final transaction between parties by Jewish law. The only time that it's a final stage, it's called Meshicha, by you pulling the milk, for example, then things change. Some said it's biblical, some said it's the Gzerat Chachamim, it's a derivative from the biblical. But the key is that if the fellow pull out the milk and you put the money, each party can back out. But if you pull out the milk, even without paying yet, then it's already ma'asekinyan, it's already acting in transactions between parties. Now, trace a situation that you have a, let's say, a money exchanger or um, variation of um, people who travel with different values. So if you take, let's say, gold, and you take a silver or silver coin or other currency, let's say, dollars. So which one is the item and which one is the money that serve in order to exchange the items? So that's a very serious question because Let's say if we are speaking uh, excuse me, about uh, dollars. So when you borrow $1,000, you are obligated to return $1,000. But if it's in a different country, let's say you borrow $1,000 and now you meet the guy overseas and over there is a change of rate in currency. How do you go about it? Do you pay, if you don't have the cash, the exact $1,000 that you bought? So when you're paying, what type of currency payment you get? You go by the time you, in a way, acquire that loan of 1000 which many times it's a different number, or you go by the that very day currency. Furthermore, there is a concept of Sahir or Verla Sukhem. We're all familiar with the story of Abraham and Ephron in the book of Bereshit, how Abraham gave him a currency that you can use anywhere. We all know that in certain countries, in certain places, there is different currencies and different values. In some countries, their currency has no value elsewhere. Others, the currency applies anywhere. With that said, we go to the next level. Let's say if you buy a copper or coins that are made out of copper or things in that nature, what exactly the exchange of currency versus the value? Biblically speaking, as we said, the moment you pay for a certain item, in a way, you can argue, you said, model this, right? I pay the credit card, right? So, in a way, it's yours, right? However, the rabbis came in with a serious concern. The concern is, again, I'm bringing a Talmudic example, but you can see soon that it can be a lot of practical lachot. Again, Reuven and Shimon. Reuven, he uh, owns, let's say, a, a state that carries a lot of a grain. And he sold Shimon uh, boxes of, of grain in a value of $10,000. It's done. Shimon already paid Reuven the 10000 but Shimon is not yet there to pick up those boxes of grain. 
Meanwhile, fire took place. So now we ask a simple question. What do you do? Ruven can say, I don't have insurance for that. You, Shimon, did not come over to pick it up. It's not my responsibility. How do you impose payment in that sense? So the rabbis want to interfere in a sense and feel that it's in addition of the two, two parties exchange, it should be something that is called transactions or in a biblical Talmudic language is called kinyanim, ma'ase kinyan, and therefore. The rabbi said even Shimon paid the $10,000 in the value of many, many boxes of grain that we went on, yet, if it wasn't an act of Kinyan Meshichah of pulling by Shimon, the, action, the transaction is not in effect. Meaning, here is a rabbinic enactment that came out to protect the parties, particularly the potential loss of one party. Now, Let's wrap up all of this to make sure we all understand because from this onward, we'll just go to details. Reuven goes to Shimon and he said, I want to purchase metal Jalim. I want to purchase a movable property. He gives him the money. As we said, that's not the done deal. Lo Kinyan. Each party can back down. If one party, the buyer, Asam Meshicha, he pulled out, then neither party, nor Uven, neither woman nor Shimon, can back down. How you treated coins or currency? Reuven paying silver in exchange of Shimon giving currency of gold. So, that, in a way, action that we call modern day the language of barter, barter meaning in a business, I give you some valuable in exchange of valuable you give me. So, some ask the late Rob Feinstein's and so So, what do you do with the action like uh, people borrow, like neighbors? You borrow milk, you borrow eggs, you borrow things from each other. So, obviously, the money itself, as far as the value of the money, it doesn't carry value because that kesef, that silver, that dollar bill doesn't carry, it's just a piece of paper. Versus if, for example, cigar or cigarette. So the Magen Abraham rules that when it's come to the mitzvot, you have to treat it differently, meaning if someone borrows something that, that carries a mitzvah, let's say you pay with bills, with dollars, bill of currency, in exchange of getting a troll, in exchange of getting a matzot, in exchange of getting a mitzvah, then the whole value of that currency carries a different meaning. And here we go to the next level, which is understanding the concept of either Tiv'a or Pira. What's the difference? We're going to use the word either Tiv'a or Pira. Tiv'a meaning that the, the, uh, the, let's say the gold, it's materials. So that's, uh, that's, that's, Tiv'ah, that's the materials that carry value, monetary values. Versus pira, pira, it's metal talim, it's chora, it can be um, any merchandise. So the question is, has a hav kone et a kesef? Ha kesef and no kone et a zahav. Here we enter the domain of understanding when it's come to gold in exchange of coins of silver, what purchase what? Because at the first glance, the way the Mishnah presented to us is Hazahab kone a kesef. Hazahab, you have here one party that involved with 
a mitzrach, not, not matbea, involved here in a way gold coins. So therefore you have the other party, hakesef, a no kone azahab. The other party acquires the other silver. However, if it's a silver, it's not acquired the gold. So it means if the buyer pull out the gold coin first, neither one of the party can back out. Because, as we learned earlier, he already made Kenyan Meshicha, already pulling the item. Versus if the seller collects the coins of silver and the other party did not have Maase Kenyan, didn't pull anything, it's still open-ended deal, and either party can back it out. The same way, we talk now about exchange of silver coins for copper coins. When one party take possession of Han Nechoshet, of copper coins, by what? By pulling it, Kenyan Meshicha, Kone et Akesef. So the moment he pull it out, then right away he acquires the silver coins. Versus Veha Kesef, a no connect and a choshet. But if you pull out the silver coin by the seller, the buyer is not necessarily purchase the copper coins. The next question is how you treated situation of flow coins, which means you have coins, it depends how you look, if it's a Rashi or the spot, but it's clear that it's Pira, Ma'ot Hara'ot. So Rashi explains that that's coins that it's already invalid by the government. Tosfot said that it's those coins that it's totally, you can see it a lot of times by a money changer. Someone comes with a bill that is torn in part, in full, not everyone are really willing to exchange for that one. Some yes, some no. That's the way it was for the experience. But anyway, overall, we call it ma'ot hara'ot, which means there is a here flow of coins. So the moment that happened, konot et hayafot. So you can purchase by that, acquire the, the good one, the unflown coins. However, hayafot. But when one party takes possession of the unflowed coins, the other party hayafot enan konot et haraot. So again, ma'ot haraot is peva, and ma'ot hayafot is tiva. Asimon, asimon, Israelis, or remember when you used to have a telephone, they have this special coin, they used to call it Asimon, but obviously here we talk the way the Rashi, the Ramban, and Pirusha Mishnayot and others, they said that Asimon is the unminted coin. So Asimon, it's like a coin that you don't have any image or anything on that coin. Kone Tamad Bea, that the other party can acquire a minted coin, the hamatbea a no kone asimon. But the other way around, if it's a minted coin, the 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 you cannot acquire the one that is unminted coin. Now, any time you have this movable estate, metaltelim koni metamatbea, matbea a no kone metaltelim. When you have the movable property, the other property acquire the coins. However, when one party takes possession of the coin, the other party does not acquire the movable property. Meaning, by pulling out the coin, that's not the acquire that movable property. So, the Machane Ephraim asks a question based on that. He says, how you treated the check? Let's say Ruven gave Shimon a check without Kinyan Meshicha, without act of pulling. Is that Maase Kinyan or not? Is that 
matter of acquisitions between two parties or not. Or take for example Reuven rent a car from Shimon and later on he paid him, not in advance, that's a later one. So the way that the acquisition took place is just by pulling it or not. <coughs> so the there are some who say that they are clear. this is the principle, not everyone. But anyway, meaning all form of movable property, each acquires the property of the other, which means the moment that one of the parties to the exchange they, uh, takes possession of the item that he acquiring, which means by means of pulling the shikha, the other party acquires the item for, from the first party. And here, the Mishnah come out and, and gives us an example. Keitzah. Here is an example. Mashach heimenu peirot velo natan maot. So you have here the buyer who with the consent with the seller, he pull out, um, let's say, produce or other things that he wants to acquire, and he did not yet give him coin in exchange for payment. So neither one of them can back out from that deal because, as we explained, we have here the clear rabbinic enactment based on our Torah that pulling it's already a matter of acquisition. Versus Natana Maot, Veloma Shachemenu Perot, Yacharulach Zorbo. But if we pay, remember we used the term of milk? You put the money for the milk, but you didn't pull it, so either party can change. And why? Because Masekinyan, the act of acquisition, just by giving the money, it's not sufficient. The same way as when you exchange coin from two different times, so the, the money the, that you pay, it's considering ma'ot, payment, and the other one, it's called pira, payrot. So therefore, if you pull first the gold, let's say, so neither one can change the mind. But if the other party pull out the payment, the coin, either one of them or both can change the transactions. Now the Mishnah come out and limited and circumscribe the possibility of changing mind after paying the money. But here the sages come in and say a very strong statement. They said, the Almighty One who exacted payment from the people of the generation of the flood and from the generation of this person, the Tower of Babel, that the Almighty punished them for their iniquities, who atidli para mimishe eno omet bediburo. He is going to take care of exact payment for a fellow that does not stand by his words. Same way as in that generation people pay for their wrongdoing, the same way the Almighty in our lang language, the hand of heaven, um, will do the, the, the right thing for that fellow. So it is true, the point here is that yes, it is true that the other party did not have Kinyan Shikha, did not pull it, only paid cash. But anyway, it was a deal. So it was ex example to the extreme of a great rabbi named Mahar Sham. The story goes that um, it was a son and a father and a stepmother. And unfortunately, the son purchased from his father in the state, and um, he paid his father for the estate, but then the father was poisoned by his 
newly uh, wife, the stepmother, and he backed out the deal. So the son took to the court of Maharsha his father. So he came out and he said, the statement of the Mishnah of Misha Parash will be, you know, used. And the problem is, the Torah prohibited any form of even indirect um, expression of cursing that will be told father, son, and father. So even if it is true that it was in our language wrong, uh, especially since he already paid him, but still, Maharsham expressed that that was the exception, that cannot um, follow this idea of Misha Para here. Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Shimon disagreed with that, and he said, Kol shehakesef beyado, yado alayemma. Anyone who carries the money, meaning the seller that received from the buyer the money, and he didn't transmit, transfer the merchandise, he is the one who takes advantage. So here it means that the fellow already holding his hands the money, he is the only one who can change his mind and say, I want to sell. Versus the buyers is already pull out and give it to the other part of the money, it's too late and he cannot back it out. Even we can argue he said he didn't have any act of pulling. Later on, on page 47, the Gemara expand of Rabbi Shimon reasoning. Now the Gemara <coughs> brings two different versions. You saw it in the Mishnah. Matnei le Rabbi le Rabbi Shimon brei. Here you have Rabbi Yudha Nasi, the chance to teach his son the way that the rule appears in the Mishnah. Hazahav, Hazahav means Chora, meaning the, the items, the coins, gold, Kone Etakes, that's the language we said in the Mishnah. Amar lo, the son said, Rabbi, Rabbi in general it's my teacher, it's a machloke, it's a different opinion between the Ramah and the Shah, what he meant by saying Rabbi. The Ramah said that it's an expression of honor because in addition of being his father, he was Rabbo Mubarak, he was his teacher. So therefore, since we learn in several occasions that one should honor his Rebbe even more than his father, so therefore that's the reason he used the term Rabbi versus the Shah said that, that that's the way the person called his father um, even when he is, he is ready. But anyway, Amarlo Rabbi, Shanita Rabbi Biyadudcha, HaKesef Konet Azah, V'tachzor V'tishnelo B'zikhnutcha Azah, Konet HaKesef. In the early part of your life, you teach us the opposite way, which is the Kesef purchase the gold. Now you tell us that the, the Kesef, considering this Ma'ot, meaning the, the Tashlum, the payment, that it's not Kone, that it's not acquired, and the goal, considering Tzchora, considering Terot, and therefore, he said, Hazahab, the goal, acquire the Kesef. So it looks just the opposite. So the Mepharshim asked why Rebbe did not answer. So the, Common said, you see it also in Yerushalmi, that that's the correct Girsa, the correct version. So, when the Kiva Eger Zatzal asked a question, if those days they used to put in the ground the gold, the silver, the valuable, the valuable item they put in the ground, because that's the essence, that's the most important part of the Ikar Shmira, the, the core idea of, of uh, guarding there. So, all this zera that we said earlier, it's not a plan. So, do you say that King and Kesef apply? Or you said, we hold that, that 
the king and kesef doesn't have any effect. Lo chalaf pam, not take effect anyway. So you see a lot of light up on the kiva eagle. But anyway, the Quran now expand on the reason, reasoning of Rebbe according to these two versions. Be'yaldutei ma'isava, in his youth, what the Rabbi Danasi hold, that he teaches us that the kesef acquires zahav, and the advantage why the other way around. In the youth he held that gold coins which are more valuable are our currency, silver coin which are relatively not valuable are a commodity, the purchase item. Kaspa de lo hashiv. So he said, when you have this commodity that, that um, it's, it, a, it's not valuable because the coin of silver is not so important and therefore the canale and acquire their peiralativa, which is the 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 Kesef, that it's considering a pira, he acquired the gold and not the opposite, which means that only the shikha, only pulling, makes the masekin and not the other way around. Versus when it's advantage, beziknu teisava, when you reach an old age, he held kaspa, silver coin, 44b, the kharif. Have a the Hava the Lo Kharif, Have a Pira, the Kanele Pira Lativa. It's fascinating to think that the mindset of the rabbis is so wise and so much applications to our days. There are more merchants and there are merchants. When it's come to inexpensive items, Merchants are very hesitant. You see typical merchant who vacillate, who is indecisive to take or not certain coin. So they tell us if it's like Overla Socher's circulate. So therefore everyone, it's universally accepted. So therefore have it tiv'a. It means that you take it as a Ma'od is a currency versus gold dahava de lo kharif. When it's come to a gold coins that they are not so much circulate, which is in a way either they are not so often or not so known, or they, they merchants thinking if I have a chance to do much with that, or they they are hesitant to accept payment for some inexpensive items so therefore have a pay so we take it as the uh, uh, plea which is like is a commodity so as we learn this important principle which is what one side one party take possessions of the commodity the other party acquire the currency so what we learn, usually there are two important items that emphasize the coin more than others. Number one, coin usually carries more value than the, the merchandise. Number two, if it's a circulate currency, and and it's easy to exchange. Therefore, that's the, the whole mindset why Rebbe, when he was um, in his early age, he thought is the value the most important thing. And then when he turned old, he, he said that the, the most important thing is that you'll be able to exchange it easily in the market. In general, when it's come to halot kinyan, to make a matter of 
exchange. Obviously, Kesef, you can argue and say that you have Halot Kinyan on Kesef. And the name of this parak, if you go by the Yerushalmi, is really the other way around. The Yerushalmi said that HaKesef Konei Tazav, and therefore, in Yerushalmi, it's not called the Perek, the chapter of Azahab, it's called a Kesef. Amar Ashi. Now the Gemara tried to prove what we said earlier. Said, Keyadutei Nistabla, Midekatani. So the, the, the way that we learned in this youth, that's more logical to say why. Because we learn that one party takes possession with the copper coins and the other acquires a silver coin. So, if you tell me that silver coin, you, um, 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 it's a exchange for gold coins, it's a, uh, and it's called commodity. So, therefore, that's exactly what we learn when one party takes possession of the copper coin, the other party acquires the silver coin. The other people pay That even if you take it and in exchange of gold, we treat it that as a currency. That's the way Rebbe learning is used. Haim the Katani, that's the reason and the Choshet connect the case. That's the reason why we learn that the copper can uh, get a, buy the, the silver. The Afar Pide, the Hava, Peira Habe, the Gabe the Choshet, Tiva Habe. That even though when it's come to the um, gold, so the, the, the silver is considering pay up, the commodity. They, they treat it as a currency. So they, 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 when it's come to copper, they, they um, it's treated as a pay up, the currency. Nevertheless, By the way, all this way we go by the Rajma. Tosfot Rosh goes differently. Says that the, the, the silver is more important than the copper, but when it comes to a market, they exchange the same way, back and forth. If you tell me that the silver coin relative to the gold coin and currency, the subsequent ruling is self-evident. When it's come to the gold coin, which are more valuable than the silver coin, you said that silver coin and currency. When it's come to copper coins, so the um, silver coins are more valuable then the copper coins is the other circulate more easily. Me by ah, it's necessary for the Mishnah to say that the silver coins are the currency and the copper coin are a commodity. That gives size basically the Kesav, Rajba, and Ritva. But anyway, Sigma rejected that and said, even you teach this Alakha, follow the Ravita Nasi, in his old age, it's necessary to teach Allah how silver and copper coin are as well. Those small copper coins. If you go to a location, the place where the copper proton circulate, they circulate more easily than silver coins. Meaning, people, Mishnam Shima, people use it a lot. So you may think that it's a result that the currency and the silver coins are the commodity. 
סור קמש מלאן, סור דתנא קמפן תיצ'אס, כיוון דאיקתא דוכתא דלא סגא די פירא ארמי, since there is a place that the copper coins do not circulate, so therefore you treat it as a commodity. So relatively speaking, uh, you see this back and forth in most of the dynamic here, um, in a sense that there is a overall agreement that the currency that it changes easily everywhere, then it's much easier to go back and forth. The problem is that as we said, that there are certain um, locations that are not accepted. So if you go by the way that we learned in the old age, we have to, to derive from that that the uh, copper purchased the silver. So therefore, we cannot prove from here that the way Rebbe Yudana Si learned in his youth is the correct one. You don't have a yeah, you don't have a proof that a kesef connect as a hub, only as a hub connect a kesef. Now the Gemara tried to bring another proof, the way Rabbi Yudan Asi learned his youth. The Afra Rabbi Chia Sabal Dahava Tiva Ali, even Rabbi Chia holds that gold coins are currency relative to silver, which means Zahav Nechshav Mamon, the gold. It's considering S currency, which means Tiva. The Rav Ozif Dinarei Mipatrei the Rav Yichia. So here we have a situation that the Rav borrowed certain amount of gold dinar from the daughter of Rav Yichia. And all of a sudden, the Sof Iyaku Dinarei. So all of a sudden, the, the gold dinar appreciated in value. Because remember, by the time that one take a loan, it's different. That time, the exchange dinar, gold dinar, for 25 silver coin, and then, all of a sudden, when they about to pay, it was double, it was, uh, yeah, not double, but it was 30. That's the way they explain, So here is a question. What's the question? Remember in the introduction we talked about the beat, about taking interest. So, I'll ask, listen, I took a certain amount, certain value. Now, if I pay it, it's Hashash Rebit. He said, go and pay her unflawed um, and weight dinar. Return the number of dinars that you borrow as the monetary value is even. Which means that we see here that dinareza have nechshavim ke mamon. That golden dinar is considered mamon. You don't have an issue of rebate of interest. Now the Gemara elaborates on this proof. I amal bishlama dahava. If you tell me that the gold coins are currency, so this works well, Shapir. Now we understand why Rokhia rules that he will pay the exact amount that he borrowed. But if you tell me that this is a, a commodity, have a sea be sea be asu. So he one borrow sea of produce and repay of sea produce that it's a tosefet, it's addition, it's an interest. As so we're going to learn page 75, as the price of the produce may increase in the interim. So later, you see even the next page in 45, that the rabbis, the sport and others, also emphasize that the rabbis are very strict when it comes to chashash and concerned that it's uh, having here interest involved. So the Gemara rejected and said, Rav, dinarei haveru. The dinars that Rav received from the daughter of Abichia did not have a regular standard loan. And Rav had dinars elsewhere. 
but he needed money immediately. The Kevan, the Havre Dinar, since he had his own golden dinar. Now, Seki Omerla, it's like when he about to take the loan, Halvini Achi Avokni, or Achem Tamafteh. So he basically said to her, you know, it's a tenth amount. It's just, the, 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 lend me money until my son comes and I, uh, I'll find the key. Uh, so, so, therefore, you can do it. Um, and it's a conclusion, it's not the issue of Rebit and Rukhia did right by telling that. So the Minchat Yitzchak, the late day wise, asked a question, when it comes to repeat the interest, the interest apply only if both parties intend to give and receive Rebit, but if it's a loan that neither party do not remember, what do you do? How you treat it based on this Gemara? I and mean, it's a long teshuva from uh, uh, there. Dan said that it's not a dim repeat when both parties not remember. The Shevet Alevi, the later of Vojna, said that if they purchase some materials and there is a time of the production, right? Question is, if you need to do some type of um, uh, sale, if you have hashash repeat. Anyway, there are a few teshuvot based on this Gemara. Amara Bahani Tana, Savar Dahaba Tiva Avi. Rabba say that the following Tana hold that the gold coins are currency, which means that it's Mammon. The Tanya Putasha Mu. When the sage speaks about Pruta, he talks about one eighth of an Italian Isar. Isar is uh, from a Roman coin. Now, what's the Nafkamina, the main Nafkamina? What is the difference that we derive from this circulation? So he said, it's a result of for the betrothed of a woman with money, which can be effected only with, uh, with money or an item worth at least shve pruta. So dinar is 25 coin. And um, I know a few rabbanim under the chupa call the edim and take the, 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 uh, the uh, ring and they ask, well, how much you think it's worth? And people think it's a joke, but they basically tend to say that there has to be more than Shrey Prutav. There is another Teshuvah from the Rav Fischer Zetzal, also about the Shari Yatsik based on this, how you treated this type of loan. Anyway, Isar, the Chad Mababa, the Sinbaba, the Nashim Kesev, the Man of Kamina, the Mecca Homimka, buying and selling, you establish the value for use in commercial transactions. Dinar shel kesef echad ne'esrim chamisha dinar shel zav imanav kamina lepidyon aben. So when you have a redemption of the first born, so it needs to give to the kohen and it says to be chamishi. That's b'mit bar eighteen. So that's what he needs to do. Ani amar b'shamati ba'avi b'sharatan b'mit edekayts el ha'emar pira avi 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 b'sharatan b'mit edekayts el ha'emar Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. If we will we'll add uh, to the dinar gold and give the additional sum along with the gold dinar to the Kohen to complete the sum of five sera. So the four shmamina. So, so the, meaning that uh, we follow the way of even as he learned in his youth. I'd like to just conclude with Tosfot Arosh. It's not actually Tosfot Arosh alone, but the others said that dinar zahab. So if you go by the Pasuk, he said that it's a Hamisha Slayim Kesef. So the question is why the Torah did not say since the coin returned one, one fifth, that it's a four fifth of the Nazaham. Why the Torah did not say it? Because when the Rosh explained, you see the Nazaham for Shin, the Torah did not want to speak in pieces. And based on that is a few Shubat that asks when you do the Pidyan Aben, you give six or seven 
Number one, the question is if it's a real money, if it's a real coin. Because as we all familiar with the difference between Rav Chaim Noel and Chazmish, um, when it's come to it's a big debate, big mafroki. So that's the reason why usually we give the coin the time of Yudhapen a little more. 